Come on now. And we are officially live. Ladies and gentlemen, happy Saturday. And welcome to a very special episode of Transformation Greatness along with SBN, the Small Business Network podcast. I am your host here, Sean A. White. And we have a very special guest that's here on the stage. This is someone that I had an opportunity to get to know. Um, her story is very inspirational. And if you know me, I'm all about providing you all with individuals that have overcame extraordinary um, things and events in their life, but also too, that's also doing great things as well to give back in this world. So if you know me, you know, as far as what my brand is all about, motivating, encouraging, inspiring the masses. And I just appreciate each and every single last one of you that have contributed um, as far as to that mission statement. So I appreciate you all. So with that being said, because you didn't come to, to hear me talk and blabber, it's never about me. It's always about our guests here. So before I bring her on, please, 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 if you catch this on the live, you know what I say, put in the hashtag live, let us know exactly where you're tuning in from. And of course, if you should be having to catch this on a replay because you're doing other things, I get it, it's the Labor Day weekend, I get it, but guess what? Put in a hashtag replay, let us know where you're tuning in from. And by the way, if you're getting great value from this, by all means, please feel free to join in the conversation, comment, share. You know me, it's all about dialogue versus a monologue. And I think I pretty much set that up in the right way. So with no further ado, we have a young lady here that is extraordinary in her own right. She is making headways as far as in her region. Her story is so inspirational. Man, I thought I've been through some stuff. Guess what? <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't nothing, ladies and gentlemen. I have no excuses. And I believe that when she comes on and tell you her story and what she's doing now to give back, I believe you'll be able to find value in that and even strength in that as well. So with no further ado, let's get the show rocking and rolling with the one, the only Miss Francisca Nunes. Oh, I like that. Wait, 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 wait. I like that. Let me say that one more time. Francisca Nunes. No longer silent. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to the show, ma'am. Oh, God. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for that introduction. Absolutely wonderful. I am honored. For both months. Before I even start, I would like to say thank you. I am honored for you to have me on tonight. It's truly an honor. Um, I follow you also. And you say my story is impacting. I heard yours. Soon I'll have you on my podcast telling your testimony. Um, on tonight, I just want to thank everybody that's um, chiming in and looking. Um, but yes, um, I have a model that I'm going to start with. I don't look like what I went through. Um, once I start telling my testimony, a lot of people don't believe it because when they see me, they'd be like, wow, you're supposed to look damaged, you know, all messed up. And it wasn't for me. So I thank God. Um, that's the high most that kept me moving. But I had married in 1998. Um, and I have to say, that at first, you know, us women, we think about the white dress, the flowers walking down the aisle, all happy. And that was my mindset, never ever divorcing. Um, it wasn't in, you know, I always made it work. But unfortunately, you know, everything was beautiful from the beginning, you know, always asking how it was work, everything was cordial, nice. And, you know, going out and stuff like that. But six years in the relationship, I started noticing, you know, he was very abusive, um, verbal and physical towards me. And I always questioned as to why, because it all me never did anything. So um, I remember one time he started with the, of course, I have to say his mom always told me what he liked for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Let's keep in mind, I didn't know um, none of that. So she, I can say she educated me. So there was never no flaws in that, but he did see flaws in that. 
And that's when the problem started. Um, I remember, I recall one time that I asked him how his work and he was very upset and he had told me to shut the, you know, F up. And I was like in the kitchen, like, whoa, you know, as a wife, you're going to ask your husband, how was his day um, to make him feel good? You know, it's not a question that's stupid, but he got upset and he turned around was like, you know, just put my dinner on the table and that's it and don't say nothing to me. So he said, yeah, take a shower. On that evening, I did make the dinner that he liked it. And this is when it's going to come raw. He had came into the kitchen, didn't like the meal. And mind you, he's eaten it several times. And the most humiliated thing he did to me that day was he threw the food in my face. Yes, he did. He threw the food in my face and told me he didn't want it. Um, at that moment, I felt Was he just scum. having a bad day or something? Like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he told me just put the dinner on the, on the table. And I did exactly what he told me. And when he came back, um, the meal was exactly what he usually eats. But that evening, he threw it in my face. And he told me, like, you know, to pick it up and make him something else. And I thought, like, what am I going to make you? That's, you know, I got off of work. I was tired. I made you that meal. What am I going to mm -hmm. make, like, one, two, three? Right. Um, so I he proceeded to go to the living room. I was picking up everything from the floor, um, you know, washing my face and just wondering, what did I do, you know, to upset him? So mm -hmm. on that evening, I, I think I made him a milkshake, um, like a smoothie or something. He drank that. And, you know, we went to bed following day, which was on a Friday. He proceeded, like, to go out. I never questioned, you know, his outings, never questioned. But on that evening, he came a little, you know, a little drunk. Mm -hmm. um, and he had told me something he's never done. And that time that he got, I think it was like one or two o'clock in the morning, he proceeded to come into the room um, and took the blanket off and told me to get off the bed and make us something to eat. He was hungry. And I'm looking like, it's one, two o'clock in the morning. Like, you know, like, let me sleep. You came in drunk. That's your problem. So, of course, um, noticing the outbursts during the week and him being angry, I got up, like, you know, the good wife, and I cooked him something, and he ate it and went to sleep. Every single day, it was a different attitude. It was something different. And the verbal abusive was getting very, very like intense. Um, I remember um, it was mostly in the weekends that it was like the fighting, the arguments. And I recall one Saturday that he had went out and he brought a lot of friends with him. This was at three o'clock in the morning, came in the room and told me to get up. He was hungry. He had some people in the kitchen. And I said, no, I didn't want to get up. And he was like, get up because you're not going to make me embarrassed. So of course, again, like the good wife, I got up and I saw three gentlemen and a lady. And mm -hmm. at that time I was making something like, like an appetizer or something. And I proceeded to go into the room. I was very upset because you bring these people in my house since three o'clock in the morning. You know, I have to go to work the next day. 100%. So as the, yeah, as the week started progressing, the verbal was starting to get abusive. Um, I recall one time we got into a real argument when I asked him how he was doing from work. I seen that he was upset and he just told me, like, you know, why you keep asking me? Shut the F up. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to you. And I approached him. I said, am I saying something wrong by asking you? I was like, I don't see nothing wrong. Why did I do that? Um that evening, we started arguing. Well, he started arguing. He was like, well, I'm getting tired of you asking me. Um, who's telling you to ask me anyway? What do I care? So it started into a tussle. So I lived on the second floor. And the tussle got to where he threw me down the stairs. Wow. And yeah, when he threw me down the stairs, I had sprained my ankle real bad. And I had to go to the hospital. Of course, he went with me, and this was him. Do not tell anybody how that happened. You slip. So, of course, I listened. I was in the hospital, I think, for two, three days. It was, like, in a, in a cast. I came home, and the usual, I'm sorry, it's never going to happen again, because he saw me in the cast. 
never believed him. Then that's when I started feeling some type of way, like, you know, how can you love a man like this that mistreats you? You know, um, on a day to day basis, everything bothers him. He goes on the weekends and he gets drunk and he gets you up from the bed. And I started to feel some type of depression that this wasn't love. This wasn't life. Of course, I had three children. Um, they never seen, I shunned it from them. They never seen the, the violence. But it started getting, instead of um, verbal, it started getting more and more, you know, physical. At times, I try not to ask him. And he would say, oh, you don't ask me how was my day. I'm a little upset. And I would be like, hold up. This is like deja vu. When I ask you, is a, is a problem? Now you're telling me to ask you. It's an issue when I don't. So he would come in and be like, you know, you, you, you make me mad. You, I want you in the house. I want you cooking. I want you this. I want you that. And I'm like, whatever I do is something, is a problem. So the slaps would come, um, the slaps would come and I would be like, okay. I was like, this is not, you know, I was young when I married him. I have to say I was okay. young and okay. I took like a lot of physical abuse for him. We own a business. Um, okay. and one time in the winter I was wearing sunglasses. He had punched me in the face to the point that he did a, you know, a black eye. And this is what's going to be, um, ironic. His sister had came into the office and noticed I had sunglasses on and she pulled them up and she saw I had a humongous black eye. Stood shut, never said nothing to me. Like, you know, obviously you have to know your brother did that. Never said anything. And I just was like, whoa, I can't even tell her, you know, he's abusing me because right. you lifted, you know, you lifted the sunglasses. So that's obviously you're condoning it. So that mm -hmm. was one incident. Um, it started getting worse and worse um, to the point that I'm not going to use that word as a little graphic, but um, the sex was never consensual. If people can get, you know, it was never consensual. Mm -hmm. It was very demeaning um, the way he did it certain times, three o'clock in the morning would come drunk. He will, he would force himself on me, um, knowing that I had to go to work to a nursing home, like get up at six in the o'clock in the morning, I will wrap up like a ball crying and actually wondering to myself, like, wow, this is my husband. You know, it's supposed to be something consensual and it's not, you know, he's forcing himself on me. So that made me as a woman feel like nothing, you know, not like his wife or nothing. Like I was like a property and, mm. and I started feeling like some type of way inside of me, like, wow, how can you do this to me? You know, you physically verbally mistreat me and I was just basically doing everything to make him happy and everything was like wrong to him mm -hmm. and I remember one time I got so sick of everything that he was doing to me um and it saddens me to say that that I went to my mother and I had told her what he was doing to me and the graphics and stuff and I said listen I can't take it no more I went to her crying and I said, I don't know what to do anymore. Um, it sickens me that he does that to me. And here is what's going to blow everybody's top. Your mother is supposed to be the one to protect you. On that evening that I mentioned that to her, she had told me to fix it. And I just was like blown away, like fix it. Like I'm the problem. And I'm just straight looking at her like, I'm telling you, this man is forcibly having sex with me, he's beating him, beating me up. And you're supposed to be the one to protect me and get me out of that situation. So of course, her being my mother um, and believing what she said, I went home, clean, cooked his favorite meal, made sure everything was fixed that afternoon for him. And no matter what I did, I started noticing that I was not um, the problem. So I saw no help with my mom. I saw no help with his family. Um, I was embarrassed to even mention it to friends because in society, everybody thought we were the perfect marriage when we weren't. Um, I remember one incident that, you know, for the rest of my life, I'm suffering from it. He had knocked me while we were tussling on the stairs and we were fighting um, that evening. And he grabbed my ankle and he literally in three areas of my ankle, he cracked it where there is steel nails holding it up um, for the rest of my life. When the winter comes, um, my big toe 
detaches and it catches a cramp and it lasts for 10 minutes. And I am literally in agony because no matter if I massage it with lotion or rub it, I just have to let it take its course. And it's a shame that he did that to me. Um, in other occasions, my right hand on my fourth finger, he disfigured that finger. Um, there was no way for them to ever get the bone in in order. So he did that. Um, various punches in my head. Um, and occasionally, sometimes I catch migraines from it. But he was not the perfect husband that I thought I should have in my life. And I know a lot of people are going to wonder why I stayed 17 years married to him. I didn't believe in divorce despite what I endured. I saw no help in the past who to reach out to. When I went to my mom, there was no help. When I went to the sister, there was no help. So I felt like trapped. But here's here comes the faith I had in God. Every year, um, I started saying, God, I know you love me. And you're going to remove this man out of my life. Not my way, your way. Um, I'll keep enduring what you're, what's happening to me. And I have to say, um, there was a New Year's coming in. He came at 3 o'clock in the morning on that night. And I was sleeping. And he came and approached me in the bed, ripped the, the blanket off of me. and he tried to force himself on me and I, I tussled with him. So when he saw that I tussled with him, with him, he threw me on the floor. He pinned me from the dresser to the bed and where he was literally choking me out. Um, my 16 year old daughter was in the next room when this was going on. She didn't hear anything, but that night I started thinking it was three o'clock in the morning. I never fought this individual. Um, am I going to let him take me out like this? He's literally choking me. I'm like numb on the floor. So of course, um, with my knee, I was able to force it out and I kicked him in between, you know, his legs. He jumped up and I ran into the living room. We started arguing there. Um, he proceeded to go to the kitchen and say that, you know, he was going to kill me, you know, B, I'm going to kill you. That's it. That's it for you. So, of course, my daughter came out of the room into the living room. This man was intoxicating, holding like a humongous butcher knife. And she tells me to run to the bathroom. Uh, I run to the bathroom. I stay in there. But when I'm in the bathroom, I'm thinking like, okay, she tells me to run to the bathroom. She's in the living room with this individual with a knife. He's intoxicated. That is my daughter. What if he hurts her, it kills her, but she's protecting me to tell me to run into the bathroom? I said, no, that's a no-no. I prayed in the bathroom and I said, okay, God, whatever happens to me tonight, let it be. Um, but I have to come out of this bathroom. There's no way this individual will hurt me in this way by, you know, killing my daughter. That was my mindset. So I ran out of the bathroom, proceeded to walk to the living room. And at that moment, let me tell you something, but God, I can only say, but God, there was a knocking on the door. My daughter ran down the stairs. It was the cops. They came up. Um, I got to say the coward hid the knife um, in the dining room underneath the tablecloth. And on tonight, I just want to say um, I'm a sweet person. I'm not a person to hurt anyone. When the cops came up, he sat in the dining room um, chair. And I'm going to be honest, um, my actions, what I did, I ran into the room and I put a turtleneck where my neck was completely bruised. And when the cops came, they were like, you know, we got a phone call. Um, neighbors are saying there's a lot of noise. There was an argument. I said, yeah, you know, he's a little drunk. There was, you know, an argument, but have I pulled down my turtleneck? They wouldn't know he physically abused me. At that moment, that individual could have went to jail because the knife was under the tablecloth. I could have said, you know what? He hurt me. He tried to kill me. My daughter is a witness. And instead, what they did was they weren't stupid. They looked and saw that he was drunk, that something was going on. So they looked over to me and they said, listen, is there anywhere we can take you? Um, until he sleeps at all. 
mind you, it was my house. It was my house. They should have removed him, not me. So of course I, I left with my daughter. We went to my sister-in-law's house. Soon as she saw me arrive with the cops there, she wasn't stupid. She knew um, exactly what was going on. And, you know, I stayed there for a little while, contemplating like, you know, 17 years, it's a lot. I, I can't do this. It was in front of my daughter. This is not what I want my daughter to learn, what a relationship or a marriage is. I need to go back to the house and tell this individual, that's it, I'm done. So um, anybody that's from Patterson that knows where Kathy Court is at, six o'clock in the morning, I walked all the way back to where um, the original CCP projects were. And knowing that this individual, we can tell so, or he can kill me, I was going to be by myself. I walked there, proceeded to go to the house and tell him, I need you to leave. Knowing the whole time as I'm walking, I'm like, listen, this can go to the left. He can kill me. There's no one there, not my daughter. So I went and I said, God, let's do this. So when I got to the house, um, I proceeded to go to the bedroom. He was in there sleeping off, you know, his alcohol. And I tapped him and I said, listen, I need you to leave. I really can't do this no more. You got approximately 24 hours to leave. All he did was mom and I left. And my hurt right now was that when I went back to my sister-in-law, my daughter was not there. Um, I got hysterical. I told my sister-in-law what happened. She was actually got in the vehicle. She left. And the one thing that made me think was, let me call my brother. And when I called him up, I said, listen, is my daughter with you? She was like, yeah. She explained everything to us. And I'm like, what did she explain? She was like, that you left to go um, with your husband and you left her at your sister-in-law. I was like, that's not so. I left her there because I told the individual I wanted him to leave. She has it wrong. Um, because of that, I lost three years of my daughter's life. Um, three years that she didn't understand that all I did was I wanted to protect her and understand that I wanted to give her a life with no domestic in it. You know, that love is not supposed to hurt. And that's the only thing that bothered me. Um, I did divorce the individual in 2014. And I have to say to the women that are listening, never have someone tell you that you're ugly, you're worthless, um, you don't mean nothing, you're not capable, because this individual always told me I was ugly, um, why go to school, I needed to stay home, cook, and, you know, tend to the kids, and I felt like meaningless, the only thing I can do was work, but I wanted to do more things, you know, something that wanted to make myself feel happy. And, and I have to say that when I divorced him, there was something I had to prove to myself. And that's that whatever he said I couldn't accomplish, I thank God I accomplished it. I wanted a model and I did that. Um, originally I came on three magazines on the front page. I educated myself. Um, I'm in professional Anything you can just imagine, mental health, human trafficking, um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, you name it, domestic violence coach, bullying coach. And I feel proud of myself that I accomplished that. But one thing I want to say that someone told me was look in the mirror. Because at one point, I, I believed what he said. And she was like, look in the mirror. And whatever you see in the mirror, if you don't like it, fix it. But if you don't love yourself, you can't expect somebody to love you. So on tonight, I want to say that when I looked in the mirror, I absolutely loved what I saw. There was nothing absolutely wrong with me. And my whole aura, my whole mindset started changing. And I just started saying, you know what? You got to learn how to forgive him to move forward. And show him that he did not break you and he does not have that power over you. And I got to say on tonight, I did the damn thing. And I'm very, very proud of myself. Um, and I say whatever I went through in that aspect of my life, I'm not embarrassed of it. Um, I learned from it. And it's something that I have to say, maybe God wanted me to go through that because now I speak 
for the voiceless because I'm fortunate to say I'm alive. It could have went to the left and I thank God it didn't. Um, my faith in God is absolutely amazing. I put everything first in his hand. I'd be like, Father God, if you think I can do this, let's run with it. So um, I'm happy to say that I had to go through something like that to educate men, women, and youth that love is not supposed to hurt. So when I say I don't look like what I went through, when I tell my testimony, people say, but you don't look like it. I said, I thank God, you know, it could have went to the left for me. Um, I took counseling one time. It wasn't for me, but I still say whoever needs it, you know, take it. It wasn't for me because me and God had this, but I started thinking I could have been an alcoholic. I could have used drugs. I could have been dependent on pills. Correct. And I thank God, none of the above. I, I dealt with it the best way I can that I get nightmares in the past. Yes. Um, but I thank God I overcome them because my mindset was I can't give the time of day or that energy to that man anymore because I learned I wasn't the problem. He was the issue, you know, so I just thank God for everything that I accomplished. Um, he knows this for a fact. Um, I get word on the street, like, you know, look, everything she's doing and I want you to see everything I'm doing because I want you to know you didn't damage me. I'm not a bitter woman. You know, I'm a loving woman. I'm very humble. I'm here to always help. I'm a listening ear. I don't care what time you call me. I'm a listening ear. And I'm just giving back um, to what God gave me was my life back. Because like I said, we have so many women and men, I have to include, that lost their lives from domestic violence because they either stay in that relationship because they think it's love um, and basically just leaving. If you're not mine, you won't be anyone's. I want to ask you a question on that. And per, first and foremost, Francisca, thank you for just to be able to articulate and be able to share your story because the numbers say, and guys, you don't have to believe anything I say. You can go ahead and look it up for yourself. But the statistics show that those that's in a situation don't make it out. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it, it's a, the percentage of those that actually overcome that, you know, the numbers is better than before, but still in comparison to how many cases, still not enough. Even if, even if the person overcomes that, a lot are actually traumatized and damaged and will not say anything about it whatsoever. And they will keep it shut. So for the fact that you've been able to come on here, which takes a lot of courage to share not only your story, but just to share your, your story, period, and be that pillar of light, right, to so many other people, that takes a lot of courage. And I most certainly commend you on that. Now, before I get to my next point, I want to address uh, Latanya Davis, and she asked a question for you. And thank you so much. Um, I can't pronounce the first name, but Gojo, he's he or she said I shared it to my Facebook friends. Thank you so much. But Mrs. Davis asked, "What can you say, please, to our youth, female and men? What would be the first red flag in a relationship or dating?" Oh, that's a good question. Ooh, that's, that's a good question. question. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, very good question. Well, for the youth, I'm going to separate the question in two. With the youth, we have to um, look at when they try to control you. Um, like I said, someone shouldn't tell you how to dress, who to be with, with your friends. If they met you like that, they can't take that away from you. Um, that's the first sign for red flags for the teenagers, especially I see it in the men where the women tell me, um, or the youth will tell me, oh, he doesn't like me dressing in a short skirt or a short um, sleeve shirt or a blouse because he says that I'm like, you know, trying to show other guys and he hates that. So when they start telling you how to dress and who not to hang around with, that's controlling issues. To me, that's red flags. Um, if you met her the way she was with friends and stuff and dressing, that's, you know, it's her prerogative. If her, her eyes are set on you, it's only on you. So with the youth, it's more likely it's controlling. And for the women, I have to say, 
you know, we can dress conservative how we want, but a man shouldn't tell you how to dress um, and also not to hang out with your friends. And for the red flags and dating, I love that question. It was asked of me so many times. Um, you have to look at the red flags and I see many a times, um, it happened to me one time, I dated somebody um, for, well, I'm gonna answer the question this way. I So it can be like the red flags, what I saw. The person saw everything I was doing, you know, events and stuff like that. And he wanted to go out with me. I gave him the opportunity and we went out on a date. Unfortunately, I never put my phone on vibrate. He knows I was always busy, disc jockeying events and stuff. And he caught an attitude. Um, before the meal came, I answered my phone and I told the person, listen, um, I'll talk to you later, um, actually on the date. And get this, ladies, he caught an attitude because he was like, that is so disrespectful. And I don't know how you can do that. And, you know, I'm into you and you should put the phone on silent. And I'm just looking at him like, ew, it's not that serious. The food is not there. And when the food arrived to the table, I said, you know what? It's time to go. I don't feel comfortable. Your attitude and your oral bothers me. And we were just dating. So how are you going to go on the jealous street and then argue on that night when you're getting to know me and you know that's my lifestyle? I didn't mean it and I apologize. So the whole time we're going home and he was like, oh, you're never going to have a man in your life because you never find time to go out with anybody. And that what you did back there was so disrespectful. And I was like, you know what? Red flags all the way. You're jealous. You're argumental. Soon as he got me to the door, I was like, guess what? Erase my number. We are not going out no more. I don't like your attitude. Because if that was a date, I could imagine being your girlfriend and I could imagine being your wife. Been there, done that. That's it. It's out the door. So I have to tell you guys, when you go on a date, make sure you ask a lot of questions. You know, um, it's important to ask a lot of questions and into the date. Um, I ask, you know, have you been married? And once they start saying three, four times, that's like, okay, um, you have an issue. And if you see his aura getting upset um, when you're asking him certain questions, then dismiss and don't say anything, just, you know, passive and ask another question. But I say, if you're deep into the relationship, get to know the family, get to know his friends, ask how he is. And it's very important before you you get into a serious relationship because those red flags start coming out when you're dating. Believe it or not, new generation, new times, they start coming out. And I look at red flags absolutely like with a comb. Like if I see something, if you're argumental and you're jealous, now nah, that's how you're going to be in a relationship. So I don't give second chances. But in the youth, just be careful because you know, on both angles, they don't like how you dress. I don't want you about around friends and stuff like that. When they start that situation, then that's not um, for you. It'll turn verbal and then it'll turn physical when you don't do what he tells you to do. So that's the use. Latanya, thank you for that question. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? Thank you as far as for that explanation. That is some great information, too. And I was just looking as far as in the comments section just to see if anyone had like anything else in which they wanted to add, which, by the way, this is definitely great value. And it looks like Mrs. Davis said exactly, exactly. Yeah. For all those that are tuning in or just coming in, um, welcome once again to Transformation Greatness along with SBN, the Small Business Network podcast, with my very special guest here, Ms. Francisca Nunes, the creator of No Longer Silent. I love how the way that sounds. Shout outs to all my brown people, by the way, to all my Boricuas in the house, to all my Me Me Mexicanos, Cubanos, Dominicanos, and all the other Anos. I love you all, right? I love you all. And maybe it's just the New York that's coming out. I don't know. But anywho, I want to talk about your show your podcast can you explain a little bit more on what on what that's about and what was the goal in terms of you creating your show thank you good question well it was proposed to me two years ago um keep in mind i wasn't looking at a podcast um really i wasn't but 
um, someone in an interview reached out to me um, before New Year. It was New Year's Eve and they called me. They were like, listen, we heard your interview and I run a podcast. I would like to see if you're interested. And I was like, oh, wow. He gave me like 48 hours to think about it. And everything he heard that I said, he was like, you can be able to help anyone through your podcast. Have you ever thought about it? So I'm not a negative person. He gave me 48 hours. I told him, listen, I'm going to tell you right now. Yes, let's let's go with it. So I created the name. I'm no longer silent because my nonprofit is a face that it has a zipper halfway. Um, and that's indicating, you know, when you're quiet and your mouth halfway open, I'll, sh I'll send you that um, th via text so you can see. And we can no longer be silent. We have to speak up. Mind you, it took a while for me to tell my testimony because I felt shame. And I thought about, you know, what people were going to think. But at the end of the day, I thought of what almost happened to me. And I said, you know what? Let me run with this podcast because I can educate people how to get out of a relationship, you know. And, and I just don't use the podcast for domestic. You know, I educate people on narcissists, um, you know, bullying, personality disorder, drug addiction, alcohol, what to see, because it's all linked in with domestic violence, uh, what to detect when that starts happening and how to get out. So I'm very happy to say I'm going on two years. I'm thankful for the person that believed in me. And I get a lot of viewings in my podcast, you know, a lot of support. And, uh, you know, the word is getting out, you know, um, I originally helped, which is not small, 10 women get out of relationship, which were very, you know, very severe, but I can say proudly that they're not, you know, they're here, you know, through my podcast, they're here. And I push hard for no longer silence. I push hard for my podcast because like I said, I speak for the ones that don't have no voice. We lost a lot of women, men, and youth through domestic violence. So I'm just grateful. It's another avenue that God brought through my path because they always say it's not when you're ready. It's when God tells you, you know, this is your calling. Go run with it. So I am very grateful. I'm very honored that I run that every Wednesday that everybody shares and they come on. Um, so, and I, like I said, I've helped a lot of people that is like my baby. Um, and I love it and I'm on to new more, you know, things that I educate in the, not only through my podcast, I educate people doing workshops also. Um, and that's coming along the way. I was very successful coming out with domestic violence awareness, a big, a big turnout. And that's what opened the doors more like, okay, I signed myself up for a lot of stuff. So I get a lot of referrals and I'm, you know, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful to God every single day that I can help, you know, and with a lot of humbleness and a lot of compassion, that's what I bring when I help. No judgmental. I don't care who you are. Call me. I'm not going to say you, you crazy. You laying, you know, your wife rape you and why you ain't, I don't do that. I listen and I, I tell them what I went through. I'm not here to break relationships either. I'll give you advice. I mean, you think through my testimony, should you be there? You know, should you tolerate that? And one day I always tell people verbal turns to physical and physical turns to death. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Very good. I have two questions that come to mind. The first question is this because i was speaking with another entrepreneur and she's a servant leader um you may or may not know her pastor gina, gina lloyd and one of the things in which that we was talking about is that when you're doing anything great in this world there's always going to be pushed back to a certain degree there's always going to be haters critics cynics mm -hmm. lord knows they're in this journey i don't have plenty of them people that told me that i was nuts for even doing this who do I think I am? I'm just, just going to be, a, you know, forever in the projects, you know, all that type of, you know, stupidity. So my question to you is this, what has been some of your challenges as you've been building your brand, you know, personally, what, what, what were some of the 
drawbacks or pushbacks that people were actually trying to give you, even though your heart was in the right place. Can, would you like to share that? Oh, of course. Good question. Um, thank you on tonight. Um, I've never had that question asked of me. Very good question. When I first started coming out with my testimony, um, I can say on his side, people were um, saying that it wasn't true. You know, I got a, a lot of negative feedback that it wasn't true. I was crazy. I was trying to like damage his name. He's a good, solid guy. But you never get to know who that person is behind closed door. So no matter what they said, I kept with my testimony is true, is true, is true. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, backfire and make somebody else happy because I know I went through that. You wasn't in my home to see. So with that being said, you're going to and it's going to throw you at what I'm going to say. I love my haters. I got to say, I love my haters because you push me. You push me to strive. You push me to get stronger. Um, and I love it. I always say, when you stop talking about me, that's when I worry. I want you to keep talking because it empowers me to keep moving. Because if I listen to you, then I'll stay still and I won't move forward with my projects. I won't move forward doing what I'm doing or giving my testimony because the mindset will stay with, oh, that person don't want me to do that. So to make them happy, you know, let me stop what I'm doing. Then they'll stop talking. Oh, no, not up in here with me. I want you to keep talking. I want you to keep hating on me because obviously I'm doing something wonderful that you don't like. Now, my other mindset is instead of going against me, work with me. That's how I see it. But. I got to let you know on Sean tonight, we need the haters. We need those enemies. We need them because they push us. That's why we are where we are right now. So we can't hate on them. I want you to continue to hate. Give me all that energy because at the end of the day, that one upstairs, he's going to keep pushing me. So we need them. People be like, you crazy to say that. I'm like, no, it's not crazy. It, I worry when they stop talking because I want you to continue talking. A thousand I worry about that. <laughs> a thousand percent. You know, I have, I have a saying, right, that if you tell me that I can't do something, mm -hmm. I make it my business to show you that I can. Come on now. And I always had that, even from a kid. And I always felt like I had to prove people wrong but now i love that i really i i love it i i i embrace it maybe it's a weird kind of fantasy i mean i am kind of special in certain ways but <laughs> but i love that because what it does it gives me that extra focus and fuel right to really be able to deliver impact to really focus on a particular project or really be able to handle that task because I know that I don't, if, if I say, oh, you know what, I can't do it. Now I have that reminder of so many people that just mm -hmm. been telling me that I can't do it because either be, be, because I'm black or because I don't have the degrees or connections or whatever the case. I absolutely love that. And people have made a career, a legacy of overcoming that, AKA the Les Browns, AKA the Eric Thomases, AKA the Dr. Billy Albrooks, AKA the Lisa Nichols, AKA the Dean Graziosi, AKA the Tony Robbins, AKA the Francisca Nunez of the world, right? And so that that is definitely very, very beautiful. I wanna address something from my audience here and from Trinity. She has a great question, by the way. I, 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 I love that young lady to pieces. She said, for the youth, Miss Nunes, can you please give an example of a red flag for youth to make it clear for us? This is good. So all parents out there, please listen up. This is good. Okay, for the, oh, I love Trinity too. I just, I wanna send her a kiss. Thank you for being on tonight. Um, I'm gonna answer the question very, very, a little strong. Um, and I'm going to mention our daughters. I'm going to mention our daughters because mostly our daughters are the ones that 
don't understand what love is supposed to be. You know, they, they go with the flow when the guy tries to control. But we as mothers have to start noticing when she was dressing a, a, a type of way at home. And then if you see she leaves the household, um, let's say in the summertime with a turtleneck. Who wears a turtleneck in the summertime? You have to question that. Um, who wears like, you know, no shorts, long pants. We have to start questioning when our daughter leaves the home like that, because if they do have a boyfriend, and I have to say, I've seen it in many, I've mentored many teenagers where the girls are telling me, oh, he loves me because he tells me he doesn't want me in a skirt that bothers him. You know, he doesn't like his girl in a skirt. Yeah, he doesn't like me in a blouse or nothing like, or, uh, you know, like those little tubey stuff. Cause he says, I look like a bee and I have to look, you know, upstanding for him. So when our daughters start leaving the house, when we usually see them dress a different way, we got a question, you know, um, because it does happen. They, they get manipulated by the men. Well, the teenagers saying, you know, you, my girl, and I don't want you to upset me because I want you to dress this way. Or I don't want you with Susan and Mary after school. That bothers me. I want you to be with me. So when he takes that um control and he wants you around him all the time and he blocks out the you know the stuff that you usually did go to the mall hang out and stuff and he stops that that's a red flag and that's something you shouldn't allow and i've seen it happen and when it goes to the left is when you start saying to him like you know you met me dressing like this i'm still gonna do it and if she asks tough that's where the verbal and the physical starts happening and they don't really want their parents to see what's going on. So that's when they start like overdressing, covering, you know, their arms, their neck. So we have to be mindful. And I've seen that I've seen it happen various times. My daughter was wearing a turtleneck in the summer. Who wears that? You know, wearing long pants, you know, long sleeves. You have to question um the behavior pattern that it's is different. I remember a movie that was called Don't Tell. And she was being abused by the boyfriend. He didn't like her around the girlfriends anymore. And he was slapping her, punching her in the arms where it was invisible. And when she was leaving the home, she was wearing sweaters, long sleeve shirts, and the mother never picked up. And when the movie was called Don't Tell Us, that the friends knew that something was going on. And at the end of the movie, he killed her. Yes, he killed her. And the friends felt bad because they were seeing it and not saying nothing you know so it's sad so we have to say something you know and i'm gonna say we got good women we got good men out there if that one doesn't work for you hey listen ain't no love laws but you gotta respect and value yourself as a man and a woman that if that's not for you leave it alone i always say next or wait because there's a lot of time in this youth, I have to say, there's a lot of time. Educate yourself first. Um, do the math. Study the person. But once they start telling you, I don't want you to dress this way, I don't want you hanging out, then you know what? That's not for you. If they try to change you and not accept you for who you are, leave that alone. Because it will turn um, to the left. And I hope, Trinity, that, that answered your question. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And um, thank you for um, explaining that as well. Uh, Trinity said there's no such thing as can't. We are made to succeed. And so total, I, I believe, I am hope I'm saying your name correct. If I'm not, I apologize. Uh, so total Gojo said, so proud of you. Oh, that's my uh, son. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Did I did I say his first name correctly? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's my okay. son. Okay, cool, cool. Because you know, sometimes I can be bad with names, so you know, I apologize if I was butchering it. Wow, you know something? I believe that this interview is definitely going to go viral for a number of different reasons. But the main reason why is because you've been sharing information which is very vital. And I believe that someone, even if it's one person, can really take this and run with it and even just find a way to have that courage and strength to get out, you know, that situation if they're experiencing that, man, man or woman, then it, it, it was definitely worth putting this together. 
And I have a saying that towards, towards the end, and, and, and you were here, if what we stated on here either motivated, transformed, or inspired at least one person, at least one person, then may God be the glory, and we take no credit for absolutely none of that. And saying that, it's not a catchy slogan or something that's real cool. That's not the reason why it was given to me by my creator, but it's because it's the truth. If one person can take from this podcast interview and really work, go towards transformation, then it was all worth it. Thus, yeah. it's the reason why this brand transformation greatness has been birthed. Thus, the reason why no longer silent has in fact been birthed. That's the reason why many um, individuals as far as my past shows came on. They were so passionate about their brands and what they had, because if it, if it can inspire one person, then that one person can inspire another person. And then that's another person. And now uh, communities are in fact transformed. And then, you know, areas, cities, regions, then heck. The whole world, even potentially, right? But it all starts with that one individual. So, well, well, well done. And I wish you nothing all, you know, um, major success. And it was anyway, and with that myself and that SBN um, team, the Small Business Network, um, can help you out in any way. We would definitely love to. I want to ask you this: So, what's next for Miss <laughs> Francisca Nunez? This is all great, but what's next? What can we expect from you within the first to three months? Will, will you be speaking in China? Will you be speaking in France? Will you be speaking at the United Nations? Come on, spill the beans now. I know okay. you've been holding back. Come on. <laughs> well, I'm ready for it. Well, I have the honor to say I have spoken in many cities and states. Uh, I have the honor, um, but I'm going bigger. I'm hopefully... Um, and I, I always reach for the skies. Hopefully, I want to be in Washington, D.C. to able to bring the platform much stronger um, up there in Washington, D.C. Um, that's my to go. And anywhere where it's needed. I have no mind traveling anywhere because the need I see for domestic violence has been growing in capacity. Um, and it's, it's a shame. And I can mention Dominican Republic is one of the areas that is prone that it's like increasing almost like in the level of every single day. And they're younger, younger, and it, it's sad. Um, so hopefully um, my strive is to one day speak in the White House. I mean, that's kind of huge. That's kind of big uh, with putting God first. But my motto is I'm unstoppable. I think I can achieve anything I put my mind to. Um, hopefully there's a couple of surprises that are coming in the mix in the next couple of months. And I just want to educate the youth, the men and the women through my workshops, through events um, that I'll be creating soon. And that's just, you know, never make it about me. Always make it about, um, I would say my community helping anyone like in need in these services and not only in domestic violence, um, tapping into alcohol and drug addiction, you know, human trafficking, child abuse, anything. I put myself up there like a soldier. So I'm here for it all. Um, I want to expand no longer silent, not just in the city of Patterson, like worldwide. So that's my ma major um, achievement that I want to do in the next three months is take it bigger because that's what's promoting me and hopefully um, working with you and networking also to just get, you know, it takes a village to, to get out there stronger. And on tonight, I just want to thank everybody that's, you know, chiming in and really from my heart that they took in anything I was saying. They know I'm boots on the ground. I am available anytime, any day. I don't care if I'm working, I go in the bathroom, I go in the closet and I'll be like, okay, speak to me. My patients are very, you know, very beautiful to me. They'd be like, girl, you know, you're crazy. You go ahead and, you know, take that phone call. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to stop you. So I'm here to help, you know, and I just thank God that he gave me that energy, you know, and that passion. And I'm going to always continue that. And I always say, when you humble yourself, you go far. You really go far. So I'm a genuine woman that I'm just boots in the ground and that, that passion is there. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what 
this show is all about here transformation greatness along with SBN, a small business network podcast it, it's about you all it's not about me it's not about my guests it's really about you all the ones that's in the audience because you get an opportunity to learn you get an opportunity to relate to reflect and this is amazing this is absolutely amazing. We've been on for 55 minutes. I feel we can go like another two hours or three hours, but we're all very, very busy. So I'm pretty sure we'll have to do a part two for that. I want to say welcome here to my business partner and right-hand man, Dr. James NBC in the house. And he said, in his words, what's up, Ms. Nunez? What's up? And he said, <laughs> always put God first. You can achieve any and everything absolutely Amen. um so Totoro so, so on um, gojo your son said we do not suffer from the shock of our experiences so-called trauma but we make out of them just what suits our purposes Ooh, mm. i like that very <laughs> profound there hmm i may have to do <laughs> that's my a, 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 a topic on that one you gave me a great <laughs> idea and mrs davis latanya davis said this is trinity she will be with little, little trend we have a voice if you want to learn more to help our youth and more fantastic 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 so how can others get a hold of you miss nunez <laughs> okay so um on facebook as francisca nunez feel free to friend request me um also my cell phone is Publix 973-979-4288. If you know of anyone that's going through a, a situation, feel free to call me, um, text message me, because sometimes they don't physically like to speak, but they address me with text messages, the problem, and I'll address it. So there's my number, the Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm reachable through the phone. I'm like a doctor on call 24-7, <laughs> put it that way. So a lot of people will be like, oh, I don't want to bother her, but i want to say please if you're in a situation feel free to call me even though i'm working anybody that knows me i'm like boots on the ground i do pick up the phone you know i do address the situation um when you humble yourself at work and you get patients that genuinely love you and they know what you're doing in the community they let you and i'll be like listen you know i know i'm on your work hours but i gotta make that phone listen go go run with it so i can basically say i address everybody's need i don't ignore i do pick up the phone and i do text real quick and say listen at the four i'm available but if it's an emergency i speak to them right then and there because i don't know what it is i have left my job to get the person to do a restraining order i have left my job to call cops on the scene i have done that so i my my profile my person my character speaks for itself i have done that i've sat in a park speaking to a domestic violence survivor for three hours and they feel bad i'm like no i don't care you need me at this moment this is what i needed years ago so i'm giving it now so the resources yeah. are there and i'm really out there to put it there so anyone i don't care if you're a man teenager woman I don't care who you are you can feel free to speak to me i have no issues you know like i said I'm boots on the grounds anybody that knows me have you ever thought about starting like a non for profit organization i have one. Oh, you have one oh. yeah it's in wow. english and in spanish i'm gonna send you that the info i have one i created that i would say about five years ago and i launched it two years ago but that's another I think that's another interview of, as to why I launched it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you feel that a part two is needed, please go ahead and drop in the comments. Put in part two in the comments if you feel that a part two is needed. And more importantly, if you like to even attend and listen in. So again, if you feel a part two is needed for this, put in a part two or a two if you feel for whatever reason no you're, you're good right here then put in a, a one guys because again it's all about creating that content and it's about you guys so i want to make sure that i'm listening to you because it's very very important one last question and then i'll let you go i like I, I like to play 
a little devil's advocate, if you will. A lot okay. of my pre previous guests, they, they know where I'm going with this. Cool, cool. So we have uh, Mrs. Davis part two and Mr. James Bryan said part two and three. Perfect, perfect. There are individuals that are watching this and they're like blown away. They are inspired. You know, you put them down an emotional roller coaster because maybe they didn't go through, but they know someone that has. They heard you, you overcome and that you are thriving and that just your courage and your resilience and just your willingness to serve is just so, so beautiful. And they're absolutely loving that. And they're cheering for you right now in their homes. But then there's that person <laughs> that's like, hmm, they could possibly be going through the situation or maybe going through some type of trauma, if you will. And they're saying, you know what? I hear you, Fr Francisca, I hear you, you know, I feel you, right? It's a beautiful thing, but I can't do on what you do. Like, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I just got so much going on right now. I don't even know even where, where to even be begin, right? With just so much. I don't even know how to even express the words, right? I, I just don't know where to turn or, what what to do and but but besides you know I got five kids you know I got you know a million of a gazillion of one things I just don't have the time I'm I don't know I, I guess I'll just deal with it and maybe one day it will improve right with wishing upon a star type of thing and if you had that individual either man woman or even child perhaps come into your office and they're telling you that and they had that defeated spirit that there is no hope whatsoever. I'm gonna give you about five to 10 minutes and I want you to speak to that person like they were right in front of you. What would you say to that interview, to that particular person starting now? The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, absolutely good uh, scenario. Well, um, for starters, um, I, I would ask them how they're doing first. Um, the whole aura would depend on um, how open they can open up to me. But if they were to tell me that situation, that they're in the relationship, that they don't want to leave it, that the person is being verbal and physical, there's children, I would ask their permission if they would allow me just to mention certain parts of my ter testimony, not too much prolonged, but certain areas that I didn't mention. Um, we as women, we're going to be scared. Of course, I was scared. You know, I was scared. I was in an apartment that was 1200. We're talking about light and gas. We're talking about cable. We're talking about three children, food, um, school, you know, clothes and stuff like that. And I was scared when I divorced them because I said, oh, my God, OK, it's one income, it's three children, all this falls on me. Let me tell you something. We as women, believe it or not, if we look in our inner strength, everything is possible. I had to get like a second job, which I disc jockey and apart from nursing. And once that happened to me, I said, this is like do or die. This is either the streets or I'm just gonna go and, you know, pull the punches to be able to survive. Because it was not just about me, it was my children too. And I said, listen, they were brought into this world by me. I'm the one that has to feed them, clothe them and give them a roof over their head. And this situation happened, let me just move forward and allow me to say this, do the damn thing, which I'm proud of myself because it's not easy to have been a single mother, um, two boys and one girl. It wasn't easy, but the individual that's sitting in front of me, if I would hear their testimony, anything she would say that I would take in that she was scared, I would say, listen, I went through that. I know some people are gonna say it's impossible. Nothing is impossible. If you have faith in yourself and faith in God, you will do it because I've been there. Um, I would tell them not to be afraid. Because to live in a toxic relationship where it's not love, whether it's verbal and physical, at the end of the day, I said it um, during my interview, physical will turn to death, um, verbal, physical, death. If they don't understand that, then, you know, we can't stay no longer in a relationship because of the children. Uh, we can't get scared because of financial 
Um, Cause later on in life, we're gonna face a lot of challenges and we just have to like move forward. I'm gonna put a prime example, a job, we are not, we're replaceable. Today I can be working in nursing, but then they'll, you know, dismiss me. I'm without a job. Then I, I have to start looking another avenue. What's going to stop me there because I lost my job. That's like, it was my job for 30 years, the end of my life. No, you proceed to move forward, educate yourself, have a lot of titles behind your back. So when that just the job decides to replace you, you have something else. So like I said, to answer your question, if I would have that young lady in front of me, I would definitely tell her not to be afraid. Um, like I said, there's a lot of resources. I would help in any way or fashion to try to find, you know, another home if she has a job. But we can't stay in a relationship because uh, I hear a lot financial. I hear a lot because of the kids. That was my mindset. And I said, enough is enough. I can no longer live like this. I was like, one day he'll kill me. And then my kids, what, in the, in, in the foster system? being raised by other people. No, I was not going to allow that. So we can't stay in a relationship because of financial. We can't stay in a relationship because of kids. Is it going to be something scary? I'm going to tell you absolutely yes, but we are capable of moving forward. So we shouldn't be scared. I'm saying a testimony. I was, and I'm here. I survived. My kids are grown you know um they're professional one of them is professional my daughter will be 28 years old september 11th she paid off her car she runs a business she works at home she has three children and i raised her and two boys um 33 and i 30. so who says it's not possible so i always say um believe in yourself believe in yourself really but don't stay in a relationship because of the kids um don't stay in a relationship because you're scared in life we're gonna go through a lot of challenges but you have to have that mindset we have a lot of people that are going through stuff but we don't give up that's my thing don't don't give up move forward once you have that faith in god i say everything is possible but don't stay in a relationship because of financial don't stay because the kids don't stay because oh i feel bad for him does he feel bad for you Mm. And my question is, does he feel bad for you? So we can't think that way. Never be scared and never give up. I've been there and done that. And I can honestly say, I'm not ashamed to say, it, I was scared. I already ran through everything I went through. And I said, okay, one salary. How am I going to do this? Are we going to be homeless? And I just was like, okay, you got to get a second job. Let's do this. Because the kids, it's our responsibilities. They're here. So we're the ones that have to push them forward. So yes, we can do it. Yes, it is possible. All I could say is never give up, but I would not allow you to be in a toxic relationship. You would be miserable the rest of your life. And we're not here to be miserable because, you know, love is supposed to be beautiful. You know, we are beautiful on ourselves and we're not supposed to be going through any pain whatsoever. Wow. Wow. You know, that was definitely um, powerful. And I was really moved by everything you said, except for one thing in which I got to ask you on this. Like, wait a minute, hold up. You said <laughs> you have three children and they're all grown, right? They're all yeah. like in their 30s and their late 20s. So I was under the impression that you were actually like a sophomore or a junior in college. And you trying to tell me that <laughs> you have three, three. In late, that's, that's two in the mid thirties and one that's 28. Oh, if you think that's going to stun you, I got grandbabies too. Seven, eight and four. Two boys and a little girl. Yes, wow. I'm grandma. <laughs> thank That's you absolutely. for the sophomore college thing <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's absolutely powerful and you know what guys i won't even dare to even ask her age because i learned a <laughs> long time ago when i was a kid that's one of the things you do not do because i got slapped for it and it's been in my subconscious <laughs> mind ever since so we're gonna leave that part right there but ladies <laughs> 
But ladies, ladies and gentlemen, if you found us to be of value, do us a favor. Please go ahead and like and share this out. Let's go ahead and make this viral because, again, th this is like so powerful. And by us all doing our part, believe me, the right people can hear this and really take inspired action. And that's what it's all about. And also, too, by the way, if you love this and if you want to leave like a donation, of, you know, any of any kind, it can be a dollar, 50 cents, five dollars, a million dollars. Well, a million dollars would be nice. Um, <laughs> by all means, go ahead and reach out to me or Miss Nunez, right? And basically go ahead and let us know on how you, you would like to um, go ahead and do so. And it'll be most certainly appreciative as well. So with that, folks, we've been on here for about an hour and 10 minutes. I appreciate each and every single last one of you. Those have been in attendance, those that have dropped off, those have watched the replay. Please make sure that you follow Francisca Nunez, the creator of No Longer Silent. She is doing um, beautiful and amazing work. And believe me, this is just the beginning. Believe me when I tell you. And with that being said, this comes to a close here on Transformation Greatness along with SBN, the Small Business Network po podcast. Want to thank you once again, Ms. Nunez. I look forward as far as being a guest on your show. And Absolutely. we're going to end this segment like I've basically been doing all my others here. And if what we stated on here either motivated, transformed, or inspired at least one person, at least one person, well, may God be the glory, and we take no credit for absolutely none of it. Until then, you're all amazing. Thank you for hanging out with us on the Labor Day weekend. By his grace and mercy, look forward to seeing you all on the next episode. Peace and love, family. Thank you for your Amen. time.